Let us now look at supersonic transport aircraft. Well, there are not many choices available here. If we look at history, the only two aircraft which have seen supersonic flight with passengers, uh, the one is the Concorde and the other one is the Concorde ski or Tu-154M from the Russian stable. Let us look at some design features of the Concorde supersonic transport or SST as it is called. First of all, the wing of the aircraft itself is a very special one. It is a very slender wing with a very low aspect ratio because that is suitable for supersonic flight and the shape is called as the ogive delta. So, this shape is called as the ogive delta. Okay. It is not a pure delta, it is not like a triangle, but it is like a curved shape for a triangle. This was uh, the first aircraft in which the center of gravity adjustment or control was achieved by transporting fuel within the various fuel tanks. This kind of uh, CG control is needed because when the aircraft transitions from subsonic flight to uh, supersonic flight, we know that there is going to be a change in the location of the center of pressure. <coughs> it will move backwards and hence there is a huge amount of change in the pitching moment which is created and this has to be adjusted by changing the center of gravity of the aircraft and in Concorde it is achieved by transferring the fuel between various tanks. This also had a drooping nose to meet the special requirements which are prevalent when you operate an aircraft both in subsonic as well as in supersonic flight. And it was also the first aircraft to have a fly-by-wire flight control system. But please note, this was not a digital system. This was actually an analog fly-by-wire control system, but the first aircraft to have uh, this feature. A delta wing platform which is used on uh, Concorde has several merits and demerits. You can see a sketch. This is a typical delta wing platform. This is not that of the Concorde. It is just an example to show you how a delta wing typically looks like. <coughs> First of all, a delta wing can give you a very large value of root chord. Even with a lower value of thickness to chord ratio T by C, which is needed for uh, supersonic flight. So, even with a very thin wing, you can get a very large tip cord and a root depth. The volume available for the fuel tanks becomes very large because of this higher T by C, uh, because of the T by C, because of the volume available. The aircraft has a very high critical Mach number, so it can fly to much higher Mach numbers without necessarily facing the drag divergence. The wing remains inside the Mach cone for high Mach number and therefore, the drag is reduced. So, at high speeds, there will be a shock wave created and the angle of the shock wave will be a function of the free stream Mach number. By providing a delta wing configuration, the leading edge is highly swept. It allows the leading edge to remain completely inside the Mach cone. There are a few demerits. The first demerit is that the lift curve slope of a delta wing is generally much lower, nearly uh, you know very low as compared to uh, a conventional aircraft. The wing, the lift curve slope can become as, as low as between 2 and 3 and the CL max that you will get will also be much lower, it is generally less than 1. Because the delta wing for a given area would have a smaller wing span, therefore, the span available for mounting the flaps reduces. So, you have a smaller flap span. One of the biggest problems with this platform is its poor longitudinal stability and control because the tail arm 
is less, the wing is much farther behind. So, the tail arm available for the uh, stability is much lower and then you have a roll yaw coupling at high angle of attack which is the cause of many accidents and many instances in uh, wings with the uh, in aircraft with delta wings. The aspect ratio of the wing tends to be low for a given area because the wing span is less and low aspect ratio we know leads to higher induced drag plus the wing also becomes heavier. One of the most serious problems that you encounter in a delta wing is that the angle of attack at takeoff which is the angle of attack at which you have approximately the maximum lift and the one at landing both these angles they tend to be very high. So, therefore, you get a very poor vision for the pilots and that is the reason why the designers of Concord had to go for a drooping nose to allow the pilots better visibility when the aircraft is coming into approach for landing at a very high angle. Concorde the delta wing also has got some very interesting features. Uh, it was designed after about 5000 hours of wind tunnel testing and the shape of the wing is such that it had to be uh, chemically milled. It was it is called a sculpture milling where you literally draw you literally create the wing out of a block of material. It is a swept wing with leading edge sweep of 55 degrees twisted and drooped to control the lift distribution over the wing. One of the good uh, features of this wing is there are only 6 moving parts called as the elevons as compared to more than 50 moving parts on other contemporary aircraft. And it has a very good ground effect which allows it to have a better takeoff uh, performance and it gives you vortex lift even at low speeds. Let us have a look at what is meant by vortex lift because this is a speciality of uh, the lift distribution or the lift generation mechanism of a delta wing. Here we see a delta wing which has got this very special vortex pattern, two vortices which are attached. You can see these vortices are dancing as the wing is rolling. Okay. So, these vortices remain attached to the leading edge and uh, they are the ones that give you a non-linear lift on uh, a delta wing. Let us have a, another closer look at the vortex lift on Concorde and also discuss the problem regarding the high angle of attack. Uh, you can see a video of a Concorde approaching for landing. You can notice that the nose was bent down, the nose is drooping downwards and here you see the curling of the vortex as the, as the wing touches the ground you saw that there was a curling of the vortex. See the nose is, the nose is deflected downwards because the aircraft comes at such a high angle at landing that the visibility of the pilot will be very bad unless you bring the nose down. So, the nose is drooped. Look at the extremely slender nose landing gear and as the aircraft comes into land as it touches down you can see a huge vortex rolling up on the wing. The fuel system of the aircraft as I mentioned uh, is very interesting. First of all because of aerodynamic heating when you fly at such a high uh, Mach number there is going to be a lot of uh, temperature issues on the structure. So, the fuel is used as a heat sink. So, the surplus heat from the air conditioning system, hydraulic system and the engine lubricating oil, this, this heat is absorbed by passing fuel over these systems <coughs> through a heat exchanger. Uh, the fuel transfer for trim and balance has already been discussed. The purpose of this is to eliminate the need for a horizontal tail and when you transfer fuel between tank number 4 and tank number 1, these two tanks, then you can also create uh, a slight rolling imbalance which can be used to trim the aircraft in roll if needed. 
the aircraft has 10 different fuel tanks and fuel is transferred as we can see. So, we have a rear trim tank on the below the tail in the fuselage and we have a forward trim tank and then we have the main and the feed tanks in between. So, before takeoff and during acceleration, we would like to have, uh, <coughs> so the fuel is moved around 20 tons of fuel is moved. So, the CG moves behind by about 2 meters, but at the end of the cruise and during deceleration, okay, we would like to uh, go for nose down. During this case, the fuel is transferred forward and after landing, the fuel from the <coughs> rear trim tank is filled in the forward trim tank to ensure that the center of gravity remains ahead and we avoid a problem of tail sitting in which the tail of the aircraft hits the ground due to CG imbalance. Let us now look at the droop nose of the Concorde and its various positions. Uh, there are four positions for the droop nose. The first position is position number 1 in which the nose and the visor are fully retracted in the up position. The visor is basically a, a pane of glass that actually sits over the canopy as you will see. This configuration is used during supersonic cruise and when the aircraft is parked so that uh, there is little least amount of uh, chance that birds and other <coughs> rodents etc. can go and occupy the area. The second position is the nose fully up, but the visor retracted in the droop nose. So, now you can see that the canopy is fully exposed and the visor is inside the droop nose. This position is used during short subsonic cruise and when you want to clean the windscreen. So, when the visor is up, the windscreen is not reachable. So, here it is done when you want to clean the windscreen and when you do a short subsonic cruise, for example, when you do a low speed fly past. The next position number 3 is when the nose is down by 5 degrees and the visor is fully retracted in the droop nose. This particular position is used during takeoff and taxi when the aircraft needs better visibility, <coughs> but not very large. You, when you come into land, the nose is down by 12 and a half degrees and the visor is retracted into the droop nose completely. This one is used for landing and taxi. although after uh, the work is over, it is quickly uh, retracted back to position number 3 to avoid any damage to the <coughs> nose. So, we can see the Concorde designers came up with a very uh, complex and cumbersome method to handle the problem of vision during the various phases of flight. In modern day aircraft, one might be able to address this problem by fitting cameras, reliable cameras. There is talk also about synthetic vision nowadays, but during the time when Concorde was designed in the early 60s, we did not have such technology and hence they had to go for this droop nose. This particular facility led to a very complex system and there were many issues regarding its maintenance and also the weight. Finally, let us look at the flight control system, the first aircraft to have a digital flyby wire control system. You can notice here that uh, <coughs> there are, you know, there are three different uh, color schemes here. You have uh, the green and the blue system. So, there are two hydraulic systems, green and blue, and then you have the yellow which is the standby. So, there are two main hydraulic systems with a third as standby. So, the two main ones are called as the blue system and the main and the green system which is powering almost every control, a two piece rudder, uh, the three plus three six part uh, uh, elevons. Okay. Uh, but the standby system is going to power only a few of these elements and it ensures that uh, the aircraft can be flown even when both the main 
channels the green and the blue are not working. Thank you for your attention.